What's up, everybody? We're back here on the Pitch Please podcast. And today we're going to be talking about something a little bit different. We're going to be talking about a question that often comes up in the journey of startups, which is when do you lean on external counsel versus in-house counsel? Are there things in between like fractional general counsel? What are these terms? Maybe you're just starting out and you're thinking, I just need an NDA. Uh, that's all I need. And at some point down the line, you're going to grow up and you're going to find places that maybe you should have been leaning on in-house counsel more. I'm not a deep expert on this topic. So today to join us on this topic, I've brought in a deep expert and we've got Brett from Good Lawyer. Welcome to the show, Brett. Mike, thanks for having me, man. Happy to be here. All right. Well, I think maybe let's start with the basics. Um, For anyone that's listening, that's just like, I've heard of the term a lawyer. I think I'm going to need one along the way. What are the ways that startups, but not even just startups, businesses would typically engage a lawyer? And what does that spectrum look like? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, it it really does depend where you are on the journey in terms of what makes sense, whether, you know, as you kind of highlighted in your intro, whether you should be using external, whether you're at the stage in your business where bringing someone in-house full-time starts to make sense or whether you start leaning on some of these new solutions coming to market. Um, For example, fractional general counsel, which is good lawyers flagship product these days. Um, I think ultimately though, you know, if we start at the beginning, early stage company in their mind, they, they just know that they probably need a good lawyer to help them with something. You mentioned an NDA. I'd say the first thing that founders should be, you know, have top of mind when they're starting a new business Um, certainly precedes, I would say, an NDA, and that's going to be your founder vesting agreements and making sure that you have the right paperwork in place with you and your co-founders so that inevitably, if somebody walks away, you don't have a ton of dead weight on the cap table. And that's not getting in the way of you continuing to grow, get capital and scale your business up. So um, that's kind of the spectrum. And like I said, we're good lawyers playing these days is really trying to unlock a new segment in between external and full-time in-house. And we call it fractional GC. Awesome. Well, I'm excited to talk about that. And so you talked about the first moment, you know, before anything, um, probably it's not a good idea to just start your business on a napkin. Um, and so maybe just shed it some light does on like start the top. Though. <laughs> it does start there with the idea, but after the idea is melted together, dishing out 33, 33, 33 on that napkin is probably a bad call. But what are some of the first two to three moments that you see most startups or businesses leaning on a legal firm um, for help for? And when does it start to maybe snowball into something a bit more robust? I would say one of the um, sort of catalyzing or crystallizing moments when founders are looking for legal counsel in those early days is when someone's looking at quitting their job, somebody's putting money in that. And, you know, in good lawyer's case, in the early days, that was a couple guys putting in, you know, 10,000 bucks to get this, this company, this good lawyer thing stood off the ground. And so I think when people are starting to allocate significant amounts of their time, real dollars, or some sort of IP that they believe is really important. Any of those can be triggers on that first sort of step when you're like, I need to find a good lawyer to help us make sure that this business is set up, set up properly. Um, and in those early days, you know, we are way before considering anything like in-house counsel. In those days, you're looking for a la carte project-based legal support. And, you know, that could be with a law firm that could be with good lawyer using our fixed fee legal marketplace, which is, you know, designed for those a la carte fixed fee projects in the early days. Um, but I would say those are kind of the, the early triggers um, for looking for for legal counsel. Got it. So these are those like as needed as they come up. Oh, we need to lean on a lawyer. And so good lawyer has some marketplaces. These are the external counsel. Can you tell me how? So the concept of then in-house uh, or even just general counsel, how does that differ? And I guess, why can't you just sort of ride on the leaning on external whenever you need it in the same scenario? Where does that change moment happen or what is the value of, of a general counsel? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, 
again, I think in those early days, everybody's just going to be leaning on, you know, external just for those projects because the volume of legal needs isn't anywhere close to really justifying bringing someone into your team. The tipping point is a little bit vague. And again, that's why we're rolling with fractional GC, which unlocks it way earlier in the journey. But the tipping point where you start to feel that need to have in-house counsel that we see is, and again, these are like sort of vague lines in the sand that I'm drawing, but um, we often see it around, call it 20, 30 employees. You've got a CFO or a CEO or sometimes the CEO who's playing lawyer way too much, not really spending you know the majority of their week on the thing that they're best at or that they were brought into the business to do, whether that is the CFO doing the modeling and the financial planning. When you have one of those key folks on the team spending a ton of their time reading sales agreements, dealing with the corporate governance, that is when, for us, we see the value of a general counsel or a fractional GC coming in and really unleashing the executive team and, and getting the legal stuff off their plate because it's slowing them down. And if it's slowing you down in that regard, you're likely also spending a ton on a law firm or you know some other legal service provider where um, the bills start to stack up. And you know, from my experience when I worked at the big firm, you know, as a fourth year associate billing out at five fifty an hour, and you know, as you get a little more experience, those price tags go up quite expediently and they add up quickly. So for us, I feel like when you have a business that has a, an executive spending a ton of time on legal stuff and that's not their sort of ordinary wheelhouse and it often gets dropped on the finance guy because it feels like it's the closest. Um, and then when you start to see those external law firm bills stacking up is really the time that starting to think about adding a fractional GC to your team can make a ton of sense, um, both from an economic perspective but also having somebody embedded in your business that you know doesn't just write you a memo on the risks or doesn't just help you paper that one contract, but is actually you know in your Slack channel, in your company email, dealing directly with your sales guys or your HR lead, someone that is like intimately part of your business that can add a legal lens proactively instead of just getting orders, you know from the CFO or the CEO and turn and paper around. Yeah, I, I like that where you've talked about this moment that's not necessarily like, some of it might be when you get to, to 20 employees, but every business is different. And so it's sort of like this moment of when your time and energy is over indexing on legal work. And the other is when you start engaging external on a more frequent basis. And so depending on what type of business you're in, that may be earlier on if there's like a heavy legal landscape. Can you tell me a little bit about? Yeah, what you and mean? I would I would say just just a just yeah. a, a good example actually is um, one of the really cool businesses that we work with, scale up based out of Calgary called Zazun. Garth, who is a good friend of mine, he's their full time in house GC, and he was probably the tenth or the twelfth employee in that business, and that was just very forward looking on behalf of, you know, Zazian's exec team and, and Darcy, their CEO, they knew they were playing in a heavily regulated space down in the States and that having that legal lens on everything they were doing, you know, pretty much from the hop was going to be really important to their ability to scale in different jurisdictions in the U S. And so in that instance, having that in-house lawyer was critical to them way earlier than for most companies, but it really does depend, you know, how regulated is your environment, how prickly are the legal issues that you're going to be running into, and, you know, how cost effective is bringing a full time or a fractional GC onto your team relative to the cost you're spending on the external firm. It's a, it's a great point. Um, there's a couple of pieces I wanted to talk about. The first is like this notion sure. of, of, uh, you know, the executive team spending more time than they should be on on legal. And so I want to understand a little bit about some examples of what you mean by that, because I think similar to other businesses, 
Um, I think there's certain elements of a business that people just say, well, I can, I can lean into that and, and do it myself. I have enough general understanding of this area. Uh, I got chat kind of over here. Yeah. Yeah. And then they just like declare, oh, I just need this, or I just need that. So what are examples that, that people can catch themselves in the moment that they're probably trying to over index on what they're doing as leaders and where they should spend time. So, you know, you talked about the need to, to think about maybe shifting that to a, to some type of general counsel model. What are those things that people sometimes try to just figure out themselves that they should be leaning on a lawyer for uh, if they're doing it in the best way possible? Yeah. So, I mean, there's, there's a couple pieces that jump out at me there. Um, the first, and I, t I alluded to it at the very beginning of this chat, getting your initial paperwork, the deal between, you know, the sort of leading minds of the business, the founders typically is super important. And, you know, don't quote me on this, but by my estimation, the number two reason that startups fail, number one is they could never sell anything. Number two is that their founder agreements weren't in place. They didn't have that organized. And that led to some sort of founder breakdown that was unrecoverable because, you know, like I kind of said at the beginning, dead weight on the cap, on the cap table where you have someone with, you know, 33% ownership that's no longer involved in the business. That is like an absolute killer for any early stage startup. It's going to make it near impossible to raise capital. And it's never going to feel right for the founders that, you know, are waking up every day and blood, sweat and tears to try to push this thing forward when they know that a third of their company is owned by some guy that's, you know, sleeping in and has nothing to do with the business anymore. Yeah. So that is like, super imperative in the early days and getting that paperwork that's standard stuff that does not require having an in-house legal function where we see an in-house legal function and again in our case we're trying to expedite that for founders with the fractional gc it's really when the most common piece of it unless you're like zazun and you're you know a serial founder with like a lot of understanding on how having that in-house lawyer can help you navigate things that you wouldn't be able to otherwise. Uh, but for most businesses, the imperative becomes really obvious when the company's legal function, which at that time typically would just be the CFO or the CEO sending contracts out to their external firm starts getting in the way of revenue. Mm. And when you're having deals with enterprise clients slow down or knock it over the line because you're having to deal with the firm and you know, you're just kind of a tiny little client and the speed isn't there or you're not getting back really practical business savvy advice or guidance. And, you know, again, I can tell you from my experience spent almost five years at the big firm, everything, when you're working in private practice within the kind of confines of a big firm, everything's about the law and the contracts. The big difference about having, an experienced lawyer that has practiced in-house inside a business before is their ability to layer in the business imperatives and the business risks. You know, it's all great to have a contract that's ironclad, but if you can't get it signed by the big enterprise, it's pretty useless to you. And what is the risk of not getting that deal over the line mm. in those earlier scaling days? So for me, when the contracts and the legal component starts getting in the way of founders or those early execs closing deals, generating revenue, that is the most common imperative that, okay, we need to bring somebody in here that is cost effective, that can understand our business and our risk tolerance, and someone that, that at the end of the day is going to help us close deals faster. I, I like the part you just brought up there where you're talking about actually not just your, you know, NDA, founders agreements, employment contracts, but if you are a B2B business, you should have some pretty solid contracts that you're signing with your end customers. Um, not just something that, you know, you, you went into chat GPT and made like, oh, help me build a customer agreement. Like these contracts have a lot of weight on them in terms of like your sales, your IP, a, a whole other slew of things. 
And so that is a big area that probably businesses sometimes neglect, which is what is the contract that they're using with their end customers look like? And the, the terms with enterprises tweak around a lot, I imagine. Yeah, that's what I was just gonna say is when you're selling an enterprise solution on the B2B front, uh, it is very rare that you will be able to, as you know, even a 20, 30, 40 person startup, be able to push your paper onto a bank or an insurance company or a big real retailer. It's just not very likely. So having somebody that deeply understands your business that, you know, isn't charging you 900 bucks an hour for the privilege is really important because that, you know, fractional GC or that in-house lawyer you brought on is going to be able to speak the same language as the lawyer on the other side, because you know, that enterprise has some, you know, senior in-house counsel on that contract, negotiating it and making sure that the enterprise is protected. And so I guess that would be another good cue is if you, as a, as a founder or a startup executive are finding yourself in situations where you're dealing directly with the in-house counsel of a large client, that would be a really good indication that you need to have somebody on your team with a, a legal at startup email that, you know, has your best interests. And, you know, I think the other important part here is can take care of those sort of legal concerns or considerations or contracts in a way that makes sense economically. If you're signing your first $50,000 deal with a bank, it doesn't taste very good if it costs you $50,000 to get the contract over the line. Yeah. So that's where, you know, I think the job of, you know, startup founders generally, but certainly startup executives or scale up executives is to constantly be doing that cost benefit analysis and where the legal bit is getting in front of actual revenue that you're close to closing. Um, to me, that is the most obvious place um, to start seriously thinking about bringing someone, at least on a fractional basis, into your team to really own that legal portfolio um, because they have the experience and the, the legitimacy, the you know ability to do that and negotiate with lawyers on the other side. Well, and I think the interesting piece about what you're talking about here too is like um, the instilled knowledge of someone that you have on your team working on similar things every single time. Because I assume that if you're just engaging external legal, you're not getting the same person on the other side of the table every time. And there's some additional context setting that they're missing in the day-to-day -day of the business. You're that re that's really, really, really wise. You're retraining every time you get a new associate on your file and you're probably paying for a little bit of that partner time just to look at it. A little bit of extra the, fat in there, right? Like, because they need to oh, relearn. Definitely. Yeah. The, that edge, yeah, because, you know, that, that, that is the big difference. When you have, you know, just thinking about myself back in my big firm days, you know, I had 100 clients. And there's only so much brain capacity I have to remember what every one of these businesses is all about. When you're dealing with a full-time in-house lawyer, they got one client typically, and that's you. When you're dealing with a fractional GC through us, they might have two, three, four clients, which is so much more manageable for them to, you know, have the context, like you said, and understand, you know, what is truly important to the business? Where do we actually need to protect, you know, our IP or our downside? And where is their flexibility? And I think that's the other big piece about when you're looking for the right legal counsel to support you with that sort of in-house hat on, you want somebody that has done it before. You want someone that has been in-house counsel at a Shopify, at a Walmart, wherever. You want somebody that understands how to work as a lawyer inside a business, which is a completely different skill set than what we're trained in the big firm you know, to build the hours and hit the targets. Yeah. So as a piece of that, obviously there's this cost benefit analysis and maybe the simple way to do it is just look at what you're spending annually on legal or what your monthly run rate is on legal. Um, and once it hits a certain threshold, start to consider um, that soon it might be time. Yeah. To switch. And, 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 and again, it is a bit vague, but I would say if you're spending over 25, 30 grand a year on external legal fees, 
it's definitely worth looking at alternatives like Good Lawyers Fractional GC because for that kind of price point, we can pack a lot more punch than, you know, Brett as a fourth year associate billing you five fifty an hour. Well, let, so let's unpack the fractional concept because it's it's a hop on the way to eventually, you know, full in-house general counsel, which I'm sure there's a point in everyone's journey, but you've helped, you know, make it more accessible by saying, I don't have to have A or B. There's a, a transition moment that could be some years long. Can you talk to us a little bit about like, what is the scale of fractional? Like, do I have to have someone on 50%, 25%? Is there flexibility in that and what that sort of looks like? Yeah, so our fractional mandates start as little as 10, 15 hours a month. And, you know, for that type of size mandate, you're probably looking at anywhere between 25 and 3,500 bucks a month for a lawyer that, you know, is embedded on your team and pretty much owns the portfolio for you. Um, and then it ramps up all the way to two, three days a week. And we've also started filling like some mat leaves with much, much larger mm -hmm. enterprise clients. Um, but the bread and butter on the fractional GC side is, you know, typically 10, 15 hours a month, call it half a day a week, kind of spread out all the way up to, you know, you're looking at having somebody on your team two, three days, really like almost half time fractional GC. Um, the other thing that we've done, which, you know, we're a startup too, and we're scaling and it's cool to watch things evolve over time. and one of the most interesting things, dynamics that has sort of played out for us is situations where um, we have some incredibly fast growing scale ups, you know, in our sort of client portfolio who don't have one fractional lawyer through us, but they have multiple mm -hmm. or we've embedded a fractional GC, call it two, three days a week equivalent. But then we've also plugged in, you know, a half day a week of an employment expert to deal with you know, the significant growth and all the bodies they're adding in Canada, or the U S and then we've plugged in, you know, a privacy expert to, cause they're trying to go into Quebec and there's a huge project associated with, you know, dealing with all the privacy regulations in a new jurisdiction. So there has been really kind of interesting ways that we've plugged in multiple, you know, fractional GC, so to speak, or fractional blank specialist to really augment, um, what that initial fractional GC was doing while still providing the business with this tremendous flexibility to scale it up or down without adding the overhead of a, of a full-time hire. That's, I think that's, that's the good... one other thing I'll mention is yeah. the cost of a full-time hire. If you want a full, like a, an experienced full-time GC on your team, even startups in Canada or scale ups in Canada, you're looking at 250 plus in terms of total, total or ca total cash comp. Like that's an expensive body to fill and it can often distort, you know, when you got the GC coming in and all of a sudden the GC is making more than every other executive in the startup by like quite a, quite a ways, it, it starts to muddy and create some internal tension. So there have been a wide variety of reasons to use fractional GC, but um, just to wrap, put a bow no, on that's it. No, it's a good to... bookend, right? Because people are like, oh, I might yeah. be spending 50 grand a year. 250 is a ways away. We'll just keep doing it until we hit 250. And now you're like, well, there's some efficiencies to be had along that way um, where you can get significantly more invested counsel um, in a fractional way. And there's a little bit of a scale to it. Um, Definitely. Now you talk. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, you know, we touched on it earlier, but I think, I think it really is the sort of two pieces of the puzzle yeah. when somebody should be really be thinking about the fractional GC. And that is, you know, the costs are mounting with the external legal provider. And the there's some executive on the team who is spending a lot of their time reviewing contracts so they can avoid sending those contracts to the external legal provider and getting the next bill. So I think when, when you feel those two things kind of coming together and, you know, CFOs, I would say, is the most common sort of persona that we're dealing with. Um, but when those two things are coming together, that's really the perfect moment, whether you're 20, 30, 40 employees to say, hey, maybe we should look at getting a fractional GC in here to own the legal portfolio, level us up, and also unlock a ton of time that one of these really critical people on our team 
is spending, you know, reviewing sales contracts. That that makes sense. No, I want to like demystify something even for myself, which is, okay, mm -hmm. now if I'm bringing in house counsel or fractional in house counsel, in a world before people were probably used to, hey, we need someone to review a real estate contract, someone to review a sales contract, someone to do employee contracts, someone to deal with some other employee case that's happening. Those all feel like different departments. You're like, oh, I guess I would use different people. Maybe the assumption is, and maybe it's the right assumption. Okay, if I bring fractional or in-house counsel, they can handle all of these things and I can gain efficiency, but maybe they can't. And you talked a little bit earlier about like how you round out with a couple specialists. Can you talk to me about, you know, when a general counsel can cover all of those things or where and how good lawyer or others manage a mix depending on the complexity of things you're engaging in? Great question, Mike. Uh, so uh, my CEO, Josh, um, who's heavily involved in a lot of the client discovery and lawyer placement um, with his team. He, he always, he always says it best, which is your best sort of in-house GC or fractional GC. That is their specialty that they, mm -hmm. they almost all started a big firm and cut their teeth in some sort of corporate commercial arena. But, time spent as that in-house GC in, in a company that was, you know, in their past that was likely bigger than yours, pulls you into all of those different places. And, you know, their specialization often is being that generalist, maybe with like a bit more of a corporate or privacy lean or something, but they are a specialist in being a generalist, which is, I know, a little bit paradoxical, but they know where the sort of limits of their expertise lie. So a great example that you brought up is, you know, dealing with the HR stuff. Almost all of our fractional GCs would be very comfortable papering and rolling out, you know, employment terms or policies for the companies they're working with. Where they would draw the line is if you have a disgruntled employee leaving the business, they are likely not running that litigation down for you. They can help quarterback it Mm. and still likely reduce the legal fees and the time that your execs are spending on it. But there is a limit to where they're going. Same on the privacy side. If you need to go do a deep dive in, you know, what's going on in California or, you know, what is the new GDPR regulation? There might be a limit where your fractional GC says, hey, that is like beyond my comfortability. We need to find some external support on this, you know, narrow piece. And that's where, you know, for these fractional GCs that are part of the Good Lawyer Network, they get a huge benefit because we have now, you know, over 170 lawyers in our network. We have specialists in virtually every, you know, corporate area that a Canadian business could, you know, require. If you need, you know, some sort of deep dive into the regulations in Japan, like that one, we might have to outsource beyond the platform. Um, but when it comes to Canadian businesses, these fractional GCs have the ability to tap into our broader network, just like I would back in my BLG days when I could, you know, go down the hall or pick up the phone and call somebody in Toronto who was a narrow expert in credit union regulations. So that is like one of the advantages of, of hiring a fractional GC through us is they also get to tap into that broader network. And, you know, I think that's one of the beautiful things about the lawyers in our community is you know, they are the rebels. They are, you know, these folks that decided to leave big law, decided to leave the in-house thing because they were looking for this new way to practice and they're incredibly supportive of one another. Yeah, I like how you kind of define it almost like if I bring it to like probably a lot of builders are in the, the SaaS space. So it's like the burst of capacity, right? You can get this burst of additional capacity in a specialization area. Um, but to your point, your fractional or in-house GC could play quarterback in the efficiencies of them translating it rather than, you know, your CEO or CFO trying to translate what's happening within the organization and then ramp someone that doesn't know about your company and then ramp them on this scenario. Like you've got a translator that actually speaks the language driving efficiency totally. on behalf of your entity, right? 
hundred percent. And and I mean, the question always originates from somewhere in the business as well, right? Like somebody in the business is running into some sort of bottleneck or pain point and is looking for that comfort or that support to move something forward from the business perspective. The other thing that I just want to like double tap to is um, nobody wants a GC or a fractional GC to come in and just be external quarterback, just the, yeah. the guy or the gal in the middle, just like sending workout and quarterbacking. What is super important when we're looking at recruiting talent and bring them into our network is a willingness, even for these folks that have been, you know, associate general counsel at Shopify. we got a couple of those guys, um, a willingness to be the doer and mm. to get shit done. That is absolutely critical. When you have a lawyer that you're bringing in house for the first time, that guy or gal has to be willing to, to move the ball forward themselves. 95% of the time. And, you know, for me, as CEO of Good Lawyer, we've got a fractional GC that supports us, you know, on a ton of the sales stuff, despite our myself being a lawyer, our COO and our head of LX, you know, there's a lot of lawyers inside a Good Lawyer, but we still have a fractional GC to help us on the sales side of things because that is outside the purview of what my COO and head of LX are doing on a day to day basis. And their turnaround is too slow for our sales guys who need it faster. And that's why we rely on, you know, our own fractional GC and you know, that's why we buy our own product. That's, that's an interesting point. Now, the other piece that I imagine comes up here um, are two things. One, which is what's my ability to scale up with this fractional concept? Because I think maybe you're like, oh, I know the firm that I'm dealing with has capacity. So if I need externally, right? So if I need 15 hours and that creeps to 30 hours, creeps to 50 hours, I assume that the the firm can scale. Now, if I start bringing fractional in-house, I imagine something that most people say like, oh, well, I start with 15. Does that mean I have to re-ramp a new person if I scale to 30 or to 45? How does that sort of work under the fractional um, the fractional mandate of, of Good Lawyer and how, how would it work for these fractional general counsels? Yeah, so that is, you know, I think one of the perfect reasons that Good Lawyer exists beyond being able to plug them into the broader network when they have specific and discrete questions is to help manage that relationship mm -hmm. between the client and the lawyer. And we have had instances where, uh, you know, a fractional's got three or four clients, a couple start to completely rip and that lawyer's capacity gets tapped out eventually. And that is where we'll look to bring on, you know, almost like a subordinate fractional GC to support them with perhaps some junior expertise, or maybe there's a specialist that can just take the employment portfolio off if you're hiring five people a week. Um, and then, you know, ultimately, if there is truly no more capacity, then going back to the network and finding, you know, another lawyer that we can bring in and get them up to speed as quickly as possible. Um, but really just being you know, at, at the end of the day, kind of like the firm at the back end, making sure that we've allocated the right resources to the right mandates. And I think what, you know, that assumption that the firm can just scale up your external firm that you're using um, is accurate in a sense. But, you know, if you are working with, and this happens all the time, uh, if you're working in those early days with, you know, the partner the tech partner who gets totally gets it and he's got or she's got a hundred clients, you know, very quickly you start to, you know, unless your bill is big enough, you start to drop down the ladder in terms of importance mm. and you're getting funneled associates. That's the other thing that people don't realize is the turnover of associates within firms. I've had buddies send me their legal bills from, you know, I won't name the firms, but from a variety of firms and, Every time I see all of these associates and these like point twos and fours and, you know, these bills accumulating and then I Google the associate and they're gone. They're long gone. So they're, I, I would, I don't, I wouldn't argue. I would state matter of factly that the turnover of lawyers within a big firm is dramatically higher than the turnover of lawyers in our fractional GC network. So when it comes to that consistency and that ability to scale up with the same human, 
um, I would say that even though on its face, it might seem like there's a never ending sort of capacity with the firm. The reality is we're dealing in a world that is like predicated on talented professionals, humans to get the job done and the ability for a good lawyer to provide consistency in that regard, I think is um, just significantly greater than, you know, the reality that you experience when dealing with, with lawyers at the firm. So I think it kind of raises sort of one question that maybe people have in their mind that's sort of like almost like the, okay, I get it. In-house counsel is valuable at a certain point. Fractional helps me on my journey there. A lot more efficiency if I'm spending good time and energy on a regular basis in, in legal and or it's consuming my own internal time as the chief internal legal expert, even though that's not, yeah. not your hat. But there's this element of switching costs, right? And so there's the big mm -hmm. firms, to your point, where turnover is probably happening in the background anyway. There's probably smaller, more boutique firms that to some people may feel like they've achieved fractional general counsel, but it's still external. Like, yeah, I deal with the same one or two people, but you're still being treated as an external client. In either of those scenarios, there's probably this inherent feeling that I now have to ramp a new, a new lawyer. Um, how does good lawyers sort of help in that transition period to help someone onboard into the business? And is the switching cost of like ramping someone new very quickly put to bed by the efficiencies that you gain? And what's that time period sort of like? I know through a lot of questions, but I guess it's sort of just like, what is the transition off or into a fractional setting from something that feels familiar that I think perceived or does know my business already? Like, how does that sort of work? I imagine it's a common... Yeah thing for people well, I, totally and, and i think this is where you know <laughs> i don't intentionally mean to like bash the firms and you know i think i had a pretty good experience generally speaking learned a lot when i was there but um this is different no firm would ever try to get in the way of a scaling technology company or otherwise bringing on a full-time in-house lawyer and I can tell you matter of factly that the big firms view the GCs and the in-house legal teams at larger and larger companies as their primary customer. That is mm. where they make the vast majority of their money is selling to in-house legal teams. That's why they're taking them out for dinner all the time. And, you know, the GC is their primary client and where, you know, is the decide the decision maker with the majority of revenue that funnels to to big and mid sized law firms, especially the big ones though. Um, so we're not trying to compete with the big firm on the project based or the bet the company legal work, you know. And I still think there is a place for the big firms when it comes to bet the company litigation. That's not where we play when it comes to you know you're going to do your IPO. Maybe we've got a fractional or an in house you know, a little squad in there to support it, but you're still going to want to use the big firm for that bet the company transaction where fractional and in-house lawyers play is run the company. And that typically is a ton of legal work that is incredibly painful to send out externally, like those sales contracts when you've got a sales guy trying to close a deal today and he gets a memo back like a week and a half later. Um, or where the CFO or the COO, whoever's doing it, is just playing lawyer in-house. So yeah. we we view ourselves as a complement to the work and the relationship that a startup or a scale-up already has with you know a big firm or whoever they've been using historically for their legal. Um, because we're trying to tackle a different pain point than really where the firms, you know, thrive and and strive to be hanging out. The other thing I that I just it. want to throw in too is the whole fractional thing generally outside of law, just generally, you know, everybody's fractional this, fractional that. Um, I do think the right fractional folks in a variety of areas can be hugely valuable. But I think what is very different from a fractional GC versus say a fractional CMO or a fractional, you know, CRO or CTO or whatever is Fractional GC is not coming in to strategize as sort of the primary component. They, you know, mm. they are there to add the legal lens and provide that 
to the executive team in a new way, but I touched on it earlier. They're in there to get shit done. They're in there to get legal, you know, to remove legal as a bottleneck to close those deals, to, you know, save some unnecessary external legal spend and to really unlock other executives by moving the ball on all of your legal portfolios. So from my perspective, you know, you're going to need a full-time CFO long before you need a full-time general counsel typically. And I think that willingness and ability and also just like how outside the wheelhouse law is relative to, you know, what most of the executives on a, on a scaling company are doing really lead to this situation where the GC, the fractional GC is, is a doer. They're getting shit done. They're saving you money. They're saving you headache and really just trying to unlock the growth in that business in a way that, you know, was previously getting bogged down by silly legal things. Super important. So I love this concept. So obviously engaging on external things as you're getting the ball rolling might make sense. Um, but if you think that you're probably spending somewhere between 20 and $30,000 a year on legal, you definitely should be considering fractional general counsel. You should, think, you should definitely, you should definitely be thinking about it. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and again, every one of our fractional customers more or less has an external law firm, sometimes several relationship, and they still lean on those, especially the larger companies. I, you know, I think of Neo Financial. Neo Financial is working with a ton of huge law firms. They have their own in-house legal team, and we still plug in a fractional to support them in a new and unique way that you know wasn't available prior. So um, I think for those scaling executives, you know, within the tech companies. Just recognize that fractional GC is a tool in your toolbox. And if you're spending that kind of dough on legal, it's one that you should be seriously considering. Yeah. And it's, it, I think people need to shift their mindset around it a little bit because some people almost think of it as like insurance or tax. But the reality is, it's also, it, it can definitely save your butt. But the time and cycles that you're spending on these things, you're not being forward looking, you're, you're spending your own time or energy just aren't, aren't practical and your spend might not be efficient either. So, um, I can't I can't name the name, but we just signed up a pretty well known sports team with one of our fractional GCs two weeks ago, and have already heard back from the woman that runs their partnerships and sponsorships department, and she she described the lawyer that we embedded Sarah as what you call her a hero, and they have never been turning and closing partnership and sponsorship deals as fast as they are right now because they have a lawyer dedicated to that team in their organization. Whereas before, you know, that really slipped down the list of priorities for, you know, the stretched in-house legal team that they have. And it's been, you know, it, it's not, it's barely a cost center because it is unlocking so much revenue to have yeah. somebody that can turn those deals out faster than before. That's awesome. Well, Brett, thank you so much. I think I, like, I learned a ton on like the transition from, you know, using, marketplace or fee for service type solutions or external counsel and where that tipping point is for organizations. And I think thanks to the work good lawyers doing in-house general counsel is amazing, but you've helped unlock that way sooner in a business or startups journey. So like I said, anywhere that you're, if you're spending 20, 30,000 a year, you should at least be considering this um, and getting proactive on your legal strategy and not waiting for the point where you're paying $250,000 externally. And don't have someone that really knows your your business and not helping sort of, as you alluded to, expedite things that matter to your business to drive revenue, right? This isn't just a cost center. It also helps you activate revenue. Um, we'll totally. put it in the show notes as well. But if people are looking to find out more about fractional general counsel, where, where can we send them? Yeah, check out our website, goodlawyer.ca, and uh, you won't be able to miss it. I love it. Brett, any closing thoughts or anything you think we missed for any startup or business um, getting into this space and trying to reflect on where or when is the right time to to lean into their legal a little bit more as an organization? I mean, I might just leave it off with, uh, you know, I feel like your your audience has got to be a pretty entrepreneurial bunch if they're listening to uh, Pitch Please. So um, I just would say that, uh, you, you know, you folks are my people. I've always been an entrepreneur since I was selling golf balls at four years old. And uh, I kind of stumbled my way into law school and got to see how 
how the big machine worked. And um, I thought there was a lot of defects and a lot of ways to improve it, both for clients and lawyers alike. And, you know, that's the journey that we're on is, is reducing the friction for business owners to, you know, get where they want to go and, you know, not pay as such a high sort of legal toll on the way. Amazing. Thanks for the discussion today, Brett. I think great, great closing advice. Um, reflect on this. Don't, don't just treat it as like a part of your business that doesn't matter. You really need to be thinking proactively, proactively about your legal strategy and making sure that you have someone that's equally a partner in this. And um, Brett and the Good Lawyer team definitely are not just from the work they do around bringing things like fractional um, legal counsel to, to the, the playing field, but I think they truly do lean into this community of startups and businesses. And so if you're looking for even just advice on, you know, the same topic of, Hey, I'm actually not sure if it's the right time. And like, I didn't want to just like reach out to a lawyer or send something to your site. I'm sure they'd be happy to talk to you. I'm sure Brett or, or Grant on the team will hey, give be you on the LinkedIn. lay down. So we'll, we'll get you connected. Thanks again for joining today. Super great topic. Uh, and appreciate your, your thought leadership in this space, Brett. Appreciate you, Mike, and hope to see you on the yacht next year. Sounds good.